Hi, I'm William Spaniel. Let's learn about international relations. Today's topic is arms races, and the big question is fairly obvious given the title of the video, but why do states engage in arms races? The dilemma is something like this. In a world of anarchy, having military power allows you to get your way, but military power is relative. So the Roman Empire, by its standards at the time, its contemporary standards, was more powerful than Italy is today. The Roman Empire was the strongest actor back during the Roman Empire's existence, whereas although Italy has more absolute power today, as though if Italy were to go back in time, it would win a war clearly against the Roman Empire. The problem, though, is that looking at Italy's contemporaries today, Italy is much less powerful than the Roman Empire was relative to the other guys that are around. And states only make relative gains against a rival if that state builds more weapons than the other state doesn't. So if you're looking at two states today, if both states build weapons, then neither one is gaining more power relative to the other one because they are equally strong. They're just making the same gain relative to one another that offsets, and there is no relative gain. The dilemma comes in, though, because arms are costly to build. You can't just magically have weapons appear on your doorstep. You have to spend money to go make them. And so if you're building this power relative to the other guy, well, you hope that the other guy doesn't build because you want to grow relatively stronger than him. But at the same time, when you do choose to build, you have to pay a cost to build. So that's being taken out of what your overall payoff is. So we can think of this like, like the following game here. So this is an arms race game between the United States and the Soviet Union. Both countries have two choices. They can either build weapons or they can pass. And when we come to, to actually look at the payoffs here, let's standardize the pass-pass outcome, that's neither state building any weapons at all, to be worth zero. So this is just like saying, hey, everything is just as it is yesterday. Neither one is gaining more powerful, rel neither one is gaining more powerful relative to the other because neither side is building weapons. So that's just the outcome where nobody builds. Now, if both sides build, you end up at negative one, negative one, because while neither one is gaining more power relative to the other one, because they're both building weapons here, they're both paying costs to build. And so that's coming out of their payoff. So we're subtracting and they're going to get a worse payoff. They're going to pay payoffs of negative one each, which is worse than if they had both just passed. That's because it's the same relative military strength. But if they both build, they're paying the cost to build those weapons. Now, the other two outcomes, it's really good for the state if that state builds and the other state doesn't build because that's actually allowing the state that builds to gain military strength. So in this one right here, in this outcome, the United States is gaining military strength over the Soviet Union. And so that's getting a positive payoff. And although the Soviet Union isn't paying to make weapons, it is getting destroyed now because the United States is more powerful than it. And the United States, of course, gets this positive one because it's gaining that strength and it's not getting a whole bunch of extra benefit because that still has to pay a cost, but it's still getting some extra benefit because the Soviet Union didn't build. And the outcome is reversed over here where this is really good for the Soviet Union because the Soviet Union is building and the United States is not. And this is really bad for the United States because the Soviet Union is becoming more powerful relative to the United States in this outcome. Now, if you are paying close attention here, you should realize that this is a prisoner's dilemma because regardless of what the other guy does, it's always in the individual state's best interest to build. So if we look at the United States here, if the Soviet Union passes, then the United States should build because this blue one is greater than this blue zero. And if the United States, or sorry, if the Soviet Union were to build, then the United States should build as well because this negative one is greater than this negative two. And so regardless of what the Soviet Union does, the United States should build. The same is going to be true the other way around, where regardless of the United, what the United States does, the Soviet Union should build. And so you end up in an outcome that looks like this down here, where you're both building and you're both getting these payoffs of negative one each, even though it is in both states' best interest. Both states would prefer this outcome where they both pass to this outcome where they both build. The problem is that this is unsustainable because if the other guy is passing, then you should build in response to that because that gives you a better payoff individually. Your self-interest leads you to build over pass, given that the other guy is going to pass. Yet nevertheless, you end up in this bad outcome because of that, and you're both getting negative one, even though you could both not build and get zero. Now, again, just like in the terrorist video, this creates a new puzzle. The prisoner's dilemma predicts that arms races should be pre uh, prevalent because, or prevalent because everyone, it's in everyone's best self-interest to go build and to screw over the other guy. Yet what we see in practice is the opposite. We see states signing arms treaties all the time. And the Soviet Union and the United States did this 
so frequently it got ridiculous with the number of acronyms that we have standing for all of those different treaties. So the next big question is, why are these arms treaties sustainable? Because clearly this is something that happens in international relations where states are not always building against one another, and we should be able to explain that. And we'll start talking about this cooperative outcomes next time. We're going to try to theorize how we get to these cooperative outcomes and how states get to these cooperative outcomes starting in the next video. So join me then. Take care.